Okay, I've, I've turned it on. I hope that's okay. I've turned on my, my mic. Okay. Yeah, okay, all right. So it should be good. And I just have to actually click on this screen. Okay. Now I can go like that. Okay, great. So in in bioinformatics, it would be really amazing if we had this total object of... It's, it's coming on. Should be okay. All right, so the, the phylogeny of all life would be an amazing thing to work with, right? We, if we could see every genome, every copy of it over time, um, that would be that would be the best basis to work on to understand life, because we'd see all the evolution and relationships implicit in that, right? And and so, you know, over time, genomes are copied, DNA sequences are copied, and sometimes with error, and this gives rise to this diversity that's represented in this, in this squiggly diagram. So... There's some mutations that occur on different branches of this tree and, and that differentiates them. But the standard in, in our field right now is that when you want to understand any genomes, you find a reference. So you pluck a leaf off the tree and you use this as a common frame of reference to, to analyze all the diversity in that tree. And so this, this standard approach, let's call it genomic, because it's focused on one genome. And so uh, this is, is really scalable well, because if you see that you can have many genomes, but you only have pairwise relationships that you have to think about with the reference. So here are these genomes, A, B, C, and D. We're understanding them by, um, by relating them back to this, this single genome. And it's easy to extend our model of all the population because we just have to compare against the reference. And we get a new in comparison. We can extend it. And this is super scalable and flexible, and, and people apply it to hundreds of thousands, and even we're approaching millions of genomes in single analyses. So that's a really good thing. Um, the, the typical flow is that you have the reference, you, you align, so you match sequences from a, a, a sequencing data set. They're usually very short, and they're, they're just fragments of the reference. So you match them into that reference, and you'll then compress the result by doing what's called alignment, They're doing variant calling. Right? So you collect a pile of reads that match a certain locus, and you say, what is the genotype in the individual represented by my sequencing reads? You can do this for every individual independently, and that's, that's what builds up. A genomic model. Uh, but this, this really breaks down quickly because it doesn't continue. You can't take the output and update the reference because even a single individual will have multiple copies of every locus. The humans, every 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 locus is at least represented twice. So so even, even representing two copies is antithetical to this model. Again, through this variant call format, it represents all that, but we can't really use it again. Like we can't put it back in the reference. Um, and that it, that's a critical problem because it means that our prior, that reference is a fixed point that doesn't evolve. And so a solution to this, um, this problem, which we can call reference bias, is to, to build a graphical model of that represents the alignment of all the genomes that you're working with. And uh, the one I'll put forward today is called a variation graph. It's a generalization of concepts of multiple sequence alignment and, and sequence assembly to, to work on collections of many genomes. And it's, uh, you know, there, there are many ways to do this. I want to be clear about that. But the, the key tool I'll be using in this talk today is this variation graph model. And so uh, the, the point is that uh, this, this graph is capturing all the variation in the population. And so if you compare things to it, the distance between any individual and that graph should become negligible, very low. The more, the more representation you have the population, the better that prior contains any new genome that you look at, right? And, and so this, this leads us to a kind of pangenomic context. So if that, if that representation contains all the genomes and all the mutual relationships, this might be a way of thinking of it, that you can have everyone as a reference. So any genome that you're working with is a reference. And, and it's harder. You can see that the number of comparisons we have is obviously much greater. And to add a new genome, you're implicitly doing comparisons with everything. And so it's a much harder thing computationally, but there's great value to it because all the, all the point of doing genomics is to see the differences because it's the differences that are interesting. And if we make it hard to see the differences by comparing to a fixed point of reference, then we've, we've kind of given up on, on some of the most interesting material that's, that's there, right? And, and this, is, this is really an issue for, uh, for larger variants. So if you have a big change, that, that definitely is something you can't easily see by looking at the reference. Perhaps you could argue that the small variants don't matter so much. A single nucleotide change in a, a sequencing read of 150 base pairs, you can probably detect. But if you're looking at something that's bigger than your read or 
something quite divergent, something that doesn't exist in the reference, something that has many copies in the reference, uh, sorry, many copies in your individual and few copies in the reference. In all those cases, you have a, have a bias that's kind of severe. And it makes it worth doing this hard compute um, because it, 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 you know, the, the valuable material is the, the input the sample, the human being on the other side of that, the bio sample from the environment, from an agricultural context, whatever it is, that's something valuable. And the com compute, I think we can, we can afford to spend um, to do better. So what is a variation graph? It's a, a graphical model that has an augmented component that, that includes information about genomes that go through the graph. So the, the graph is a sequence graph. By sequence graph, I mean that the, in our case, we label the nodes with sequences. So we, we have a DNA sequences on the nodes. The nodes also have identifiers. This could be implicit, but here they're actually drawn out for clarity. So it's say that's node 82. And uh, the edges between them represent ways you can walk through this model. So this is kind of a simple, on its own, it's like the simple, like Markovian kind of model you could imagine walking through it. And you, you simulate sequences that sort of look like the population. Um, but uh, you, you actually can, can make exponentially many sequences in how many bubbles you go through. And, and so, you know, most of those don't exist. And in fact, when we build it, we build it from real sequences. So it's very natural because of these reasons to record the genomes, the DNA sequences that went into the, the graph itself. And that's what makes it a variation graph, that we remember the paths of the genome that's built from as, as kind of first order entities in the system. So it's made of nodes, edges, and paths. And the paths are describing uh, walks across the nodes of the graph. And here we're kind of ignoring a few details that matter that make this different than just a multiple sequence alignment. Um, for, for example, the nodes of orientation, I guess you could say multiple sequence alignment you have orientation too, but this also has a reverse complement and the path can go the other way through it. But what we can do as well is uh, represent loops, so the cycles can occur and that those are actually very common naturally and inversion. So those are very, very easy to represent. And, and a, another thing you can, it's not easy to represent the multiple, multiple sequence alignment that comes out here for three is a, like a translocation or like a fusions of different chromosomes and things like that. So all those, all those things become, become very easy to represent. And in fact, I'll argue that any kind of actual genetic variation that occurs can be natively represented in the system. There's no, there's no need to break it because of something strange. So it's totally encompassing. And so this, like, I think that this is so kind of natural that if you were to talk about genomics to someone who didn't really know anything about the field, they might assume that we work with these kinds of things. Like that, that, would, that would just be like how you do it. And, and the anecdote I have to, to say that is like, this is almost 10 years ago, but there was a whole phase of, hey, we, we now we have information about human genomes. Let's make the reference, which is our prior, have more information in it. And this is called like rebooting the human genome. So, uh, you know, there, there's several popular science pieces about this. They talk about using these graphs, which all this sort of in the community began to agree with the right way to go. And uh, yeah, this is a, another visualization of them. It was discussed in public on, on Hacker News, I think elsewhere, but I love this quote from Woodhand. Uh, I don't think anyone who knows them, I, I don't know who they are either, but they said, basically, isn't this like clear? Like when you made that first human genome, didn't you know this was gonna be a problem? And like, why did you build a whole field around something you knew was broken? Uh, you know, like surely it's foreseeable that tooling would be crucial and that solid software foundation would be invaluable. And in <laughs> this quote, I, I show this to a lot of people who were the, the key developers and they said the same thing. They said, yeah, we knew that. And, and we, we decided it was too complicated because we, we, wanted, we didn't have a single reference. So we're like, well, let's just get to the point where we have one point of reference and like, that's a good standard to work on. In fact, they were totally aware and there were arguments about this. And, and if you if you know the UCSC genome browser, you know the UCSC release of, of genomes, there's a, a phrase that you might have seen called golden path. And that actually refers to the, the path that was traced through the same kind of variation graph model that they built from the, the sequencing data from this collection of genomes they had. So they had, they had, they had backs from, from like eight or 10 people. And those were assembled, and then they found the golden path through them, the most kind of representative path, which is sort of manually curated, actually. 
So, so it's a, it's you know it's been out there, but then we we built everything differently. And then when we have lots of genome assemblies, we have a new problem: how do we represent the variation between them? Because it's as if we forgot that that was an issue because of the the, the course of development. So these these variation graphs are pangenomic fundamentally. They're about thinking about many genomes, and that's all the that pangenomes means: many genomes. And and so they're they're this common kind of approach that lets us tame the complexity that's inherent there. So here we've got this, uh, I'll describe it a little more clearly. This is like a linearization of the graph, which is kind of order all the nodes along. And you can actually see that these are bit vectors. And so now these paths to the graph, they're represented by these characteristic bit vectors. Pretty much anything that I can do in population genetics and downstream analyses, I can actually do in this matrix. And we're, we're working on that. I won't, unfortunately won't present results on it, but, um, this does work. I mean, you can do GWAS by looking at a column and asking if that's associated with, with a phenotype. And you can take this matrix and you can do a neighbor joining tree and you can do phylogenetics on top of it. And then your phylogenetics is like structural variant aware without have, having to think about what kind of variation you're, you're working with. Um, you can do a PCA to look at population structure and history. Um, and I think a lot of the things fall out of that pretty easily. And and so it's a, it's a nice you know, it, it maybe it's scary to think about, hey, I got to think about a reference at the graph, but this is much easier to, to deal with than thinking of a VCF file. So it's a, it's kind of a unifying framework that simplifies things. It's also not really a new idea. People keep coming back to this. There's an example from transport networks as well that, that's really similar, like people moving through a transport network, their paths are like the paths of genomes to the variation graph. I won't show that. This is another example. It's about developing human intuitive interfaces to complex collections of text. Sounds familiar, right? Uh, in this case, they're thinking about poems. These are uh, representing, this graph is representing nine versions of a poem about the Italian Roman countryside, actually. And uh, if you're an archivist and you wanna understand how that poem evolved, this person rewrote it, makes it really easy. It's much easier than looking at 40 comparisons. You know, you can look at this and see that it, they're always talking about the arc the bow, rather, of the violin, measuring something in silence, like those are key words. And then the, the, the poet is changing these other parts, they're evolving. Um, and this gives us immediate perspective on something that actually is quite hard to look at and think about directly, you know? So, so in fact, they call it a variant graph, and I didn't know about this until I was uh, submitting my thesis. My, uh, my roommate told me, because he works in archival research. So so it's a native, it's like a innate idea. It's an easy one to to come to, and it's something that I think it's naturally work with. And so in this time when, you know, in human genomics and genomics in general, people were saying, hey, let's work with a, a pangenome graph. Let's work with this graphical model. There was a, a meeting at the Laurent Center in, in, um, in Leiden where the, this working group got together and, and laid out a framework for what kinds of things would we have to, to update and fix. What's the what's the what are the flows of data in a system that's based around pangenomes? And this figure here shows that it's from a paper I'm not citing properly. It's called something like um, computational pangenomics. It's that simple. Um, you can you can look it up. But the gist of it is that all the things that we're used to doing, like mapping reads against the reference, we can do that against the pangenome. Right? We can also do variant calling against the pangenome, new new frame of reference. But there are new options that we have. If we can update our pangenome. We couldn't really do that with the reference. Um, we can sample things out of it that represent haplotypes in the population. We visualize it natively and understand the structure of variation. All these things were implemented in the variation graph toolkit, BG, which is this kind of hub for research level ideas about pangenomes, a place to put initial implementations that we then build on. And I'll give a bunch of results from that from that train of work. So this has been uh, first in collaboration with my PhD advisor, Richard Durbin, but also we, we established a bit of a worldwide team with a few other groups. And the one that's now carrying the torch is Benedict Patton's group, at UCSC. So uh, uh, this, is the, this is the first paper where we really show that the idea had, could give us a gain over standard techniques. And, and to do that, we had to replicate the standard techniques, but in a framework that generalized the reference to be to be um, a graph. So what we do is we build a sequence aligner, 
that can take one of these variation graphs as input and index it and map reads against it. That's called VGMap. And it is actually a clone of VWA mem. It uses the mem, like the maximal exact match concept, which takes a sequence, uses an FM index, a full text index, to find all the maximal matches between the query and, and the target. So those are matches that you can't extend any 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 further in the query and have them still matching anywhere in the target. You can take those together and chain them in, in a way that actually BWA uh, mem proposes. We do that on the graph instead. And so we get something very similar in performance. This this shows that it works. This shows that it helps to, to reduce reference bias. We have a, a, a reference individual. <clears throat> it's called HG002. And it's a standard target for resequencing analysis because its genome has been really well characterized by many, many different resequencing methods. And, and so there are true variants that are really well trusted, and there are heterozygotes among those. Thinking up here, we're looking at every heterozygote um, that is in this genome. And we're, we're plotting them by the, the size, the, their size. So if they're a SNP, their size, let's say, is zero. So they're, they're represented here in the middle. And if it's an insertion, it's over that way, and a deletion this way. And thankfully, it comes right back. Uh, basically, this line shows the fraction of the alternate allele among the observations that we collect. If we map against uh, variants that are in Fowles Genomes Project, then we don't have any bias. It's, it's basically always at 50-50. If we were to run against the, the reference, so this is BWA eBay's combination, then for SNPs, there's no problem. For really short MLs, you're fine. But as soon as you have anything very long, you start to be unable to align across it or even align to it. And this means that you see very little alternate allele. You see the reference much more. And just to show that this is really only an effect of having, uh, having put the variance in the graph, if we take variants that are in this individual but are not in the thousand genomes, which is something like 1% of the variance. And so the error bar is quite big. Uh, you, but you see the similar kind of trend in green here, as you've been blue. And so this shows that the reference bias is eliminated if we remember, if we remember the variants that are in the population. And so that was a, there, there's other versions. I'll show more details about how we evaluated this in a, in a later point. Um, so we're like, okay, this, this is cool. This appears to be working. Uh, we have simulations as well. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll reflect on those in a second. But we, we applied it to a bunch of other things. And the first one we thought would be cool to apply to is ancient DNA. That's a case where the reads are short because, because naturally they're short. You can't make them longer. They've been fragmented by nature. Um, and they have lots of errors too. And because they have lots of errors, it's harder to see real variation. But if you know about the variation, then you can remove bias to that fraction. And then you you... Um, you're just suffering the fact that there that there are um, that there's a high error rate, but it's a, it's equivalently affecting your your so-called reference matching and non-reference matching reads. And this is these are some examples of it. So to build an intuition of what's going on, if you take this this is an ancient DNA sample. It's from a someone from the steppe uh, in in uh, Southwest Asia and in Eurasia, I should say, and something like four or five thousand years years ago. So it's, and it's a very nice sample because it, it's, it's extremely deep. It's a 20 fold coverage in should be in If you map with BWA a lot with a standard approach, and then here we've mapped back to the graph to kind of see what, what's going on in terms of the alleles. Uh, the gist of it is that you can't match many, many reads that would cross this indel. And in fact, it has, it has like neighborhood effects. So that indel is in phase with this, this particular SNP variant. And so you see that there are many, many more reads for the alter, for the reference alleles and the alternate one in both because of this kind of joint effect. But both of these exist in other people They're in thousand genes project. So if we map to the graph directly, then we just don't have any bias. And we see the same number of reads approximately going through both the alleles. Uh, and this kind of replicates this length frequency bias plot. Uh, we don't have a true set, so we have to kind of guess what we think is true. And that, that causes some kind of <clears throat> some kind of distortions here. But you can see that it's, there's a very few, very severe uh, reference bias for BWA align, um, which which can't be the line in Dell's at all, and it's not true for, for the VG graph. 
uh, then this is useful because you can see things that you you know about that might be medically relevant in the present, and that gives you some greater insight into how they arose in the history of the human population. An example is this so-called CCR5 delta mutation that is associated with resistance to HIV, and it's associated with resistance to the bubonic plate, uh, the plate in general, excuse me. Um, and if you were to do BWA line just directly on the samples, uh, and look at this locus, you don't see any reads that support it. And, and even with DW amount, you would see the same kind of thing. Very hard to get a 50 base pair read and find a 32 base pair and then, Whereas if you put it in the graph and then you put a line for the graph that we surject onto the reference visualization, then you can see it in all these samples at, at, a, at a level that is basically 50-50 with the, uh, with the um, reference alone. So another thing that's interesting to think about is that the graph is a way of remembering the population. And then if you have functions that would scan across the reference, you could have them scan across the graph. One of those functions you can do is to scan for certain DNA sequence motifs. So sequence motifs, uh, characteristic motifs like this are associated with certain DNA binding proteins. So if you find something that matches this motif, it's very likely that it's TTCF protein could grab onto it. And, and so if we scan this across the reference, we, we find a certain number of hits. But if we were to look at the whole pan genome, in our case, we have 5,000 haplotypes, we'll find more hits. And, and we, we basically showed in this paper that in, in a handful of motifs that we examined, uh, you do find non-reference hits, uh, and many of them are quite significant. So there really are sites that exist, uh, site, binding sites that exist in a population that don't exist in the reference. So the reference is actually like the graph is, is a better reference for, for understanding the, the genomes of the population. An obvious thing that you might want to do is to look at structural variation. And to, to systematically do that was hard. When this project started, we only had one complete assembly of any human. And all the other ones were of lower quality or incomplete. And most of the analysis of large variation was being done by aligning reads of, of various types, increasingly longer ones, but nonetheless aligning them to the reference and following variants. And, and this is, it does work, you know, you can find lots of structural variants this way. We decided to take those and augment the kind of graph we're building. Those, those variants weren't in the Thousand Genomes Project, but they were made by the, um, it's called the HGSVC. It's like an SV group of the Thousand, Thousand Genomes Project and continued working on it. And so we took the variants from that and we, um, we showed you could genotype structural variants efficiently using the same tooling. Uh, this is just a, a one-off example to show how it works. If you were to align against the reference, you could see that there's something going on, but you don't really see a complete description of it. You see it, something that's not clean, that, that shows that there's soft with reads, you don't really know how they fit together, and you see your read image drops, and, and that's a mess. Uh, if you have the graph, you put the variant in the graph. Then if you have a new sample, you can just genotype it directly. And this, this is just showing leads against the graph model in the bottom. And so, so this was actually key for, for this paper. So this is kind of preliminary work building up to this. VG map is pretty slow. It's something like five to 10 times slower than BWA mem. And that, that makes it prohibitively expensive to run large computes like 5,000 genomes. Um, so we have 5,000 haplotypes from the 1,000 genome project here. And to rectify this, the VG team, led by Uni Siren and Benedict Cotton, developed a, a new kind of read mapping system, which is based on uh, a, kind of aggressively matching against the set of haplotypes that you have. So VG map was looking at the graph. VG giraffe, it's called, um, is, is looking at all the haplotypes and it's, it's first indexing them, it makes a Kamer index of the haplotypes, well, a minimizer, so it's a, a sparse Kamer index. We've, removed large fraction of the tamers, but we keep enough that we cover the genome. And it uses those to match reads. The, the reads are clustered by position using a distance index that decomposes the graph into a kind of tree that lets us quickly see the distances between different things. Um, as long as the graph is pretty much linear, which is usually the case for human genomes and informatic regions of genes, then this works great. Um, yeah, then there's this kind of exact matching, and uh, this is where the exact matching gets fun. So we actually can look into a, it's a, it's a succinct index of all the haplotypes. So that it's very small. Um, it only takes tens of gigabytes for all 5,000 haplotypes. 
and you can extend those matches, exact matching style against that. And then finally, if you don't match the whole read directly, which you actually do something like 85% of the time or 90% of the time, um, you can do a little bit of a cleanup by doing graph alignment, sequence to the graph alignment. And I didn't mention this, but this is actually really well known um, for multiple sequence alignment. You can easily extend algorithms for dynamic programming of sequence to graph matching to work on a sequence to sequence matching to work on graphs. This is a representation of it. You, you have these recurrence relationships and, and they just get generalized. So they think about multiple nodes when you're looking like at your um, predecessors and ancestors and, and it just works out. So we can use this kind of stuff to, to patch up the alignments. So this is the simulations that promised. So here, <clears throat> here we have a genome, we know the truth. We take the NIST genome and we simulate reads from it. So then we know where each read comes from. And when we align it back to the graph or to the reference, we can ask if we align it correctly. And so we get a receiver operator characteristic where um, optimal would be this top corner. And yeah, optimal will be in the top top left corner, and people on Zoom can't see. Um, and uh, just to, to be clear, this this scale, this is the sensitivity, true positive rate for recall. And it's uh, is a linear scale. The error rate is actually in, in log scale. And so it gets quite low. This is 10 to the negative 7 at the very edge, and 10 to the negative 6 uh, here. So um, what am I getting at? The gist of it is that VG map, which is in paint, extremely accurate, sensitive. It's pretty much getting the best area under the curve for all these different um, configurations. These are on human. The ones on the right are on yeast. Um, we actually built the yeast graph out of multiple whole genomes. That's another conversation. Uh, giraffe is in green, and it's, it's kind of close. The differences are very marginal, and that's fine because we can do a lot with it, and it's really important because it's super, super fast. So the runtime of giraffe it's even less than the BW right now. Whereas VG is, is just slow. It's, it's too slow to use. And because it runtime is very fast, um, we, can, we can apply it to, to all these high value genomes. So this is just replicating our prior result that basically shows that um, also for giraffe, just like the VG map, if the, if the alleles are in the graph, you don't have reference class. Whereas BW then does. Um, and, and this is the, the first paper that shows that you can then use this downstream for variant calling. So I think the standard variant calling approach does, finds the, the variance of a new individual against the reference and augment that by changing the mapper to be the graph mapper. And then at the very end, when you do the calling, you actually do a kind of surjection process. You project back to the reference locally, fix up the alignment. Um, the point is that you're getting more information because you, you put the reads in the right place. Right? You've represented the alleles in them correctly. And, and then you can use that to do variant calling. And so the F scores of variant calling are, are much better. Um, in, in, I mean, we're talking about very few false positives, like this one per two megabase pairs or something. Sorry, this two per megabase pair, right? In, uh, in, in this in this plot, um, only 10,000 or so in the genome, but it does better. Uh, and that's, that's something we've actually consistently seen since this paper. So I will, yeah, the other one is about SP benchmarking, it, it works. Um, and this, this is a fun biological result that comes out of it. This is the PCA from structural variants. If you're not a human geneticist, you might not remember the one from, from SNPs, but the gist of it is in the thousand genomes, you have the simplex in the first two principal components of the PCA. It looks exactly like this for SNPs. You have the, um, this is the East Asian population, African in Europe, and the Europe. A very typical thing that on the face of the globe we're going to spread out and, and we get the same kind of spread here it's not oriented as you might expect but that's that's just a bit and and this is done just with the structural variants and so it shows that the structural variants are behaving the same way as the SNPs in an aggregate sense and that was the first time we've been able to do this study at scale because before this we, we had very it was very difficult to accurately get genotypes for structural variants okay so we can use these things, right? But if you remember, it's hard to build them because all the data we had was based on short reads against the reference. Like how do we bootstrap the whole process of improving our prior? We didn't have the data. So we're, we're kind of 
we're kind of doing half the job, right? All of all of our graphs are actually reference based because we start with a reference, we add small variance on top of it, and so there must be stuff that we're missing. And uh, yeah, Lisa, the question like, you know, what if you had complete whole genome assemblies? What would change? What more could you do? What new problems arise? And the obvious one is like, how do you build the, the graph? So I'll get into that. Um, but what's happening, I, I'm sure if you follow bioinformatics, you're aware of this. Basically, we have single molecule DNA sequencing, which is a, a revolution in nanotechnology that is allowing us to observe complete single molecules of DNA in their, in their native form without any kind of manipulation. And the two techniques that really matter are what's called, uh, this is called Pacific Biosciences in the field. The technical name is zero mode waveguide imaging. So we can look at the progression of a single polymerase, which is in the bottom of a, a nano well, in, in, inside an evanescent wave of fluorescent, this is for fluorescent imaging. So the, the light, incident light makes an evanescent wave, but just in the bottom of this thing. And so when a, when a DNTP, a nucleotide with fluorophoron on it is pulled down into the bottom and held there by the polymerase as it's being incorporated, it'll be in this region longer than if it just flows in through the browning motion that's occurring in, in the solution. And this shows up as a, a kind of signal, a fluorescent signal over time. And so there's a movie you can take looking at an array of these that will then tell you the sequence of every one of the, the DNA sequences that's passing through those. Um, and this is, this is cool, but it's actually very noisy because fluorophores flow in occasionally by accident and you really can't tell the difference. So the, the raw error rate of this is below many <clears throat> is, is like 10% or more. But it's, uh, it's like white noise. And so if you have many reads of the same thing, you can completely eliminate the error. You come very close to it. And the, and the trick is that you take the original DNA molecule and you make it into a circular DNA. It's being stranded by adding two dumbbell adapters at the ends. And then the polymerase, as it runs around, is, is actually doing a rolling circle amplification. You, you're in effect synthesizing this DNA sequence, but you're observing its synthesis. And you're reading all these subreads, you can align them to each other and get a kind of perfect read or really close to perfect read. That's called a high fidelity read, high fi read. Um, and that is, is greater than 99% accuracy, but really greater than 99.9% in most cases, and it can be up to 20,000 base pairs long. And so it, it spans all the repeats in the human genome, really almost any genome. Um, and the other thing that we can do now is to look at single DNA molecules because they go through a pore that's an electrophoretic membrane. This is called nanopore sequencing. The gist of it is we can see electrical changes <clears throat> that occur in this system as different DNA base contacts are inside of it. And by, by taking known like validation samples, observing the traces, you can build a model that does this projection pretty much real time. And, and you can get a DNA sequence reads out of it. So you might think of it as some kind of perfect electrical current, like, oh, every time I see a T, it's like that. It's not the case. You actually have a whole context inside the pore, um, and it has path, uh, sorry, history dependence, too. So the real traces are very crazy. They look like this. Very hard to interpolate, but yeah, thanks to machine learning techniques, it's very easy to do that projection. And so we can get complete reads that are, are just native DNA. They can be up to a megabase per long. Um, in practice, they're not usually that long. They're more like 100,000 base pairs long. So that's very big, right? And, and this matters because genome assembly, taking those fragmented reads, putting them back together, always have this kind of um, limit that if your reads are smaller than things that we call repeats, if you read sequences, or their error rate's too high to differentiate the, the differences between those repeats, this is the information theoretic like maximum you can do. Like you can't do better than what's called the string graph that collapses those repeats. And these reads, by being so long or so accurate, they, they span those repeats and then let us untangle the graph and get a complete assembly. Um, and this actually can be done automatically now without any manual intervention. You just need the right data types. So the, the way this is a, there are many workflows that do this now. The, the one that I'm more familiar with is called Burko. And the way that it works is that you build, you build a graph kind of up here is showing a graph construction out of the hi-fi reads, the very active reads. <clears throat> it uses the compression of homopolymers, which are where most of the errors occur, um, that kind of represents the sequences in a, in a compacted way with high entropy. Then it builds a graph. 
and then it aligns those very long nanopore beads to the graph to untangle places that are still collapsed. And so it, 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 it affects the untangling of the string graph, in fact. And the result is, is amazing. So this is a deployed individual that's been sequenced and assembled. The haplotypes have been labeled, whether they come from the maternal or paternal haplotype. This is a view of the string graph that it produces. You can see mostly it's these big bubbles. And that's, those are places where you really know the two haplotypes, how they distinguish from each other. In a few places it comes together, those would be some homozygous runs that must be the same in the two haplotypes. So you can't pull them apart, but you can in effect go back later and say, okay, these are the two sequences in, in completion for every one, every one of the chromosomes. Um, and this works for all the chromosomes with the exception of the acrocentrics. And these are ribosomal DNA. Let's talk about that in a minute. Um, that's kind of the last frontier of what we, what we can do. Okay, so we have this way to make, automatically make, complete, complete genome assemblies de novo. And this flips the whole problem around. Like now, now we need to understand how to see the differences between them and characterize them. How can we take many of those complete assemblies and understand what's going on in them? We haven't had tools to do that because we didn't have the complete assemblies. But I think you can imagine that the variation graph model is a natural foundation for a lot of these kinds of analyses. So the question is, how do you take the complete assemblies and make a variation graph? You need a new kind of aligner, a new kind of multiple sequence whole genome aligner that can scale to the size of a whole genome, and it can scale to hundreds of genomes. So no, nothing we really have before is, is able to do this or designed to do it because we didn't really have the problem. Um, and so there's a few parts to the, the pipeline that, that I implemented, um, and we should say we implemented. It's a, it's a collaborative project in my group and with um, something like 20 other institutes. So we've, um, we have a three-stage process. So first we would align the sequences in a pairwise fashion to each other. So that's the basis for any, any kind of graph. The graph is representing the alignment. First you make the alignments and then we'll condense them. So do this pairwise alignment, actually use a method that's based on a work from Santiago, um, the wavefront algorithm, um, as he calls it. And uh, we use a version of it called bidirectional wavefront algorithm. We'll describe that in a second. Uh, and then we can take those pairwise alignments, many of them, and they apply a graph. And we can, we can condense them into a graph. It's an algorithm called Sequish. And then finally, once you have the graph, you can manipulate it. So you have a function that takes the graph, does some stuff to it, and makes another graph. And that function, those functions could be many, but one of the more useful ones is something that might run a small like normalization kernel across the graph so that you condense it completely so that the representation variation is the way you like, the way you can interpret it easily downstream. We implement that in something called smooth XG. So, so what is this wavefront algorithm? What is WF mash? Um, WF mash refers to wavefront mash map. Mash map is a homology mapping algorithm. It's very efficient. And in effect, it sketches pieces of sequences that are very big. Uh, we usually use 5,000 base pair sequences, but you can use even bigger ones. Um, makes a very small sketch of those and then can compare them to each other. So it uses this to build up a kind of coarse homology map of all the sequences you're comparing. But that map is not enough to make the graph because we need the exact base correspondence. We need to be able to say this particular character in this genome has the same like evolutionary origin as this other one. And, and to do that, we have to have the exact pair with lemon. And we get that through uh, standard dynamic programming type approach called the simple quirks. So if we were to do the full dynamic programming matrix for a pairwise alignment, you fill out this quadratic kind of amount of work. And, and that's nasty because we're, we're working with something that might have many, many gigabases on a side. And so this becomes exascale and crazy. Uh, you'll never imagine doing it. But uh, we reduce the work through this mash mapping and then we reduce it further through this. This is an observation that this is away from algorithm, right? The idea is that you can get the same result here doing only this much work. Because if your criteria is you have to have something going from one corner to the other in the alignment, then uh, once you get to the end, if you progressively explore, you know you don't have to evaluate all this other stuff. That's kind of approximately the key insight behind it, I guess. Yeah. And we, we do, the quirk we do is actually, we don't align single bases. We align even bigger segments, like 256 base pairs by default. 
Um, and this, this allows us to, uh, so we actually align those with sketches too. So we don't even think about the single basis. And uh, this leads to what's called the uh, high order uh, WFA, or we call it WF Lambda, because it involves a kind of callback function. And then in practice, we don't even use the, the image I showed is not fully representative. We do a recursive um, recursive formulation of this that finds finds the, the approximate path of the optimal alignment um, to a certain level of granularity by by partitioning the problem without remembering anything, and then goes back and fixes it up in small pieces. And this allows us to have uh, very low memory, so mem memory that's in the order of the divergence and not the square the divergence, which would be the case for this. And that's called the bidirectional wavefront algorithm. So those those are all, and it's, this is all based on a few pieces that were just formulated recently. So we're, we're really pushing the envelope of what, of what we can do in terms of scaling sequence alignment. So then like, how do you build the graph once you have it? You will, um, you can have a really, really simple algorithm. We'll just run through all the text, every position, you see what is mapped to that position, what is matched. And that's represented here with these, um, these dotted lines. This is what's called an alignment graph in the, in the literature. And, and so we take this alignment graph and we traverse the matches, make a transitive closure. We do a kind of union find operation that will collect all of these. Everything matched together by definition will be a single character in the alpha graph. And we can do this for every character and every sequence, um, you know, remembering which ones we processed and remembering the mapping to the graph and also remembering the mapping from the graph back to the sequences. And by doing that, we're able to make the ratio graph out of any set of matches. So for, for various reasons, the thing that we build might be kind of messy, disordered, right? Like we built it, this looks nice, but we actually build it, we see in an order that doesn't match the topology. Note eight is here, right? Because we came to eight later, right? Um, and so that, that means that the, the local kind of model of the graph or ability to, to slice into it and look at it is it, complicated. And, and so we, we sort the graph. Uh, we sort it in one dimension using an algorithm based on stochastic gradient descent that is optimizing the, the, the order and the distances in the, in the sort to be close to the distances in the paths in the graph. Use the paths as a kind of distance index to then structure this uh, this model. We can do this in two dimensions as well, but here it's easy. It's nice to do it in one dimension because then we can we can slice pieces out of this and then work with them independently. And that is, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't show you about this, the smoothing, let's say, like smoothing algorithm, then we'll run the kernel across little parts of this and emit, emit an output graph. Um, and then once you've made something, you have to be able to look at, into it and understand what you've built. And so we have a toolkit called Aji that uh, is, is meant to be a Swiss army knife of operations on the graph. And it actually implements things like the sorting algorithm <clears throat> that we're describing. That's a two-dimensional version of the same figure from the last, uh, last slide. And we can do things like um, you know, this two-dimensional layout that can be helpful because the graphs, they're very sparse, very stringy because they're made from DNA, which is strings. And so they often have a structure you can actually look at to get insight into what's going on in the graph model. Whereas if you had a very high degree graph, but with things would become very knotted, it might be hard to look at. Often we're actually able to look at it in just two dimensions. So, so given this kind of graph, we can then cut out pieces of it. If you would cut out uh, a pair of genes in, in the reference that are a copy number polymorphic in the population. So individuals have multiple copies that might have just one. Um, and they're called C4A and C4B. This is, this is like a pairwise alignment, taking one reference as a, as a basis and then comparing other assemblies to it. And you can see that some are missing one of the copies, some have two, and, and, and so on. Um, and in the region of the graph that we cut out, we can look at that graph region in this, in this matrix view. This is sort of the binary matrix perspective. It's actually not binary. You can have other information in it. Here it's just presence or absence. This is showing the progression through, through the structure. Uh, but this one's kind of the most interesting because it shows the number of times that a genome goes through a particular position in the nodes. So the color gray represents the single fold covered. Color red means you go through twice, and orange would be three times. So it shows that this is the loop that you can go through multiple times. And that's that's visible in this pers perspective here. This is a, 
a visualization of this in another tool called Bandage. So this is a way to, to understand what we've built and to cut it, interface with it, and it lets us also work with all the existing uh, legacy formats, which are not really legacy because we keep using them, but we can use a, a FASTA file. We can extract that from the graph. We can um, take intervals, uh, annotations, a bed file, and, and project that onto the graph or use that to actually pull parts of it out. Uh, there's lots we can do. So that's about, about half of the talk. Um, probably less than half, probably more than half the time. So the rest of it will be about, you know, having this tool, making amazing data, what, what do we get to learn that we didn't have before? Okay. <clears throat> so it's a project called the Human Pangenome Project. And it arises because folks are like, hey, we can do this with the technology. So, yeah. um... The other thing is that probably uh, to this point, I will just reserve some minutes for questions because I believe the audience afterwards will have uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, that was scheduled to be an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, you can leave whenever you want to. I'm so. personally yeah. very biased because I'm enjoying it a lot, but. Uh, uh, I, I won't be offended. Anyone can go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. That gives you enough background. Then you can just read papers. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I should have said this at the beginning. I, I'm open to questions, and I was kind of expecting them. But but if you don't say, you might be assuming that I shouldn't I think ask. This it. is the so, most valuable contribution. I mean, so. I had a lot of the talk. Having interaction with Eric can exactly. really, really, really contribute if interesting. So feel yeah. free to reach out and ask questions, if any. Stop, it really, you're stopping at any time. So first off, does anything come up that you want more discussion about? Everyone's comfortable. I was wondering on the technical part. So if I understood correctly, you you camerize. So it works like on camerizing the genome. No? Which which part? The so we build this um, graph, no, which you know with belong um, different sequences incorporated uh, the different variants that we can have. My question really is, how would you deal with errors? For instance, if you're mapping RNA seq reads. Oh, not in. Mapping onto this, yeah. If you, if you map stuff onto it, it doesn't affect the graph, right? So if you if you were to take an RNA seq read and align to it, actually, there's a paper on RNA seq. I'm not discussing here, but it's from the same crew of people. Um, but yeah, we, we map RNA seq reads to a, a splicing graph. In fact, yeah, exactly. But it's it but, is based on on matching gamers. It's on, the alignment's yeah. based on like uh, matching whole sequences, basically, like, whole thing. and it might be based on exact matching of cameras, or it could be based on mem finding, like exact match finding, there's different techniques to drive it. Okay, so, yeah, it's not so we have the same problems that you have when you align against the reference, like, if you have a difference in your read, it's going to mess you up, maybe it messes up some cameras, if you do camera matching, maybe it makes it so have the exact thing, you know, it, it'll all the same issues were there, but just that the, the target is now graphic, this graphical model. That has a variation in it. Is that is that what you're getting at? Or if you're thinking about build, so if you're thinking about building the graph, any error you have in the sequence you're putting in is going to be in the graph. Okay, so there's no way to remove that. Of the structure. Yeah, you, you could you could go later and be like, oh, hey, the, this this particular one, like I don't trust it because I see it in one genome. We could cut this out with Audrey and be like, oh, that's low coverage. Remove it. Remove that part of this path. Cut the path into pieces. Right. You, you could do all this kind of stuff to try to remove errors. You could imagine that this doesn't exist at all, but some algorithm that sort of sees chunks of the graph and is like, I don't trust that part because it looks like something bad. Okay. So you could you could do downstream processes to deal with it, but the assumption is just that the sequences are correct or that there's some reference that you want to work with. And actually all the steps we have, they're usually quite lossless by, by design so that we have the same coordinate system in reference sequences, like in a, in a FASTA file even, as in the graph. Like all the sequences are perfectly represented. Um, and that, yeah. So, but, but yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of, you're right. You're heading the right direction in the sense that like, if you have an error in the input, it's, it's just in the graph. Right. I see what you mean. Like, I was thinking that the, the structure implicitly like implied that you have to do exact camera matching, mm -hmm. but on top of the graph, you can have different strategies. Yeah. Yeah. It can be built from any set of matches. Yeah. Here, the matches are actually single character. And that's, yeah, that's the simplest way to think about it. But you, yeah, you can, you can also take a De Bruyne graph. And you, you can actually transform it into the same kind of graph structure that doesn't have overlapping nodes. It'll be bluntified, we call it. And it's exactly equivalent. Yeah. Yeah. My question about all these part of genome, because for, for now we have uh, 
reference uh, genome that is uh, extremely good quality, uh, 20 years to create uh, the tune. And uh, the most genomes are actually the, uh, aligned to this genome. It's how we must do it. They are not the novel. Uh, no, the other genome, yeah. No, no, that's that's what we're, that's where we are right now. I'll, I'll get to that right right here. Yeah, it's in the next the next like little tiny bit actually gets to this exact question. So um, there's well there's a few things to point out. I'll, I'll answer your question with respect to what we've gone through before. This this assembly better than the reference. The reference genome is missing huge chunks in every chromosome that correspond to the centromere, which is a repetitive sequence system that is where the kinetic core attaches to pull apart the chromosomes during replication. And, and so that part is invisible. Here, you can see there's no gaps. In the reference, there's a chunk that says N, or, or it doesn't say N, it has like some simulated sequences in it. So, so that's that's already kind of touching on the question, but it, it goes further in time. Is that, is that, is that helpful or do you want to dig further? Well, the question was about the qualities and the yeah. data and Exactly. Yeah, the quality matters. Um, and your quality is bounded by your input sequences because if they just get lost as they represent the graph, then of course any error in your input sequences is represented by. Another yeah. question is about alignments. Uh, any comments about dragging alignments? I, um, I guess Illumina has made some system to do to take giraffe and they compile it into an FPGA, maybe. And it seems like it works. The problem there is that you don't know what the graph contains because they don't make it public, right? And and that's we've been having some issues understanding results that come out of that system because of that. So that, that that's just the question of like open source software. You know, if you don't if you don't know what the target is, then you don't know like are they getting good results because they put the truth in their target or like. Yeah. Cool. I, I don't I don't know the details of it. Yeah, I don't I don't know the details, but I, I hope everything's open. I don't think that the, the FDA design is, is open, as far as I know. I'm not the design sure. may not be open, but but if you don't know what the graph target is, that's a problem, right? So they open source the, the, the dragon design? Uh, oh. As far as I, as I read, yeah. it's called, there was a thing in the beginning, bro. So the idea was a bit, to make a service, a private service for the payment for that. But uh, we already used the uh, Maria Broad, and uh, I think the alignment also will be uh, with the broad. Uh, I'm not sure it's open source, but I suppose it should be open source. So it's a kind of private and the public part. <clears throat> what I know is that the machine is not cheap. Uh, yeah, it's like really fast, not not cheap. Okay. Um, I'll keep rolling unless there's any more burning questions. I think some some things will start to get resolved because now now we're talking about the last three years of development, basically. Okay, so so what is the Human Pan Genome Project? It's uh driven by this organization called the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium, which is like uh, you know, it's a continuation of the Genome Reference Consortium, and really it doesn't replace it. It's like, like all the same people and, and more friends who got together and are working on this. It's a, it's a natural continuation of that project. Um, and so the, the goal is basically to make a representation of global genetic diversity. And to do that, the first phase of the project will make 350 diploid assemblies. And we've made about 150 so far. Um, the published version that's being referred to by this is 47 individuals, uh, the draft uh, human pan genome. And that, that pan genome is comprised of three main components as a resource. It's the assemblies, which are the novo, and, and they're very high quality. And uh, they're, yeah, they're, they're greater quality than the original reference. And also alignments between them. And how do they match to each other? So we've, we've derived all those different models for those. Um, and there's also um, gene annotations and other kinds of information on top of them. The goal is that you would have an ENCODE quality kind of covering, maybe not ENCODE quality, but very deep covering of annotation information for every one of the haplotypes that you can then bring together nice. Um, I won't belabor this too much, but there's many groups involved from population sampling to the production of the sequences, to the assembly, to building the pan genomes, um, analyzing them, and then outreach to try to expand the project so it has more partners and has more, more people putting their genomes in it and, and reusing it. And there's an embedded ethics group that works works with all the groups to try to make sure what we're doing is 
is beneficial for humanity um, and, and, and the people involved. So the timeline is kind of like this. Like we'll start with this alpha, which we've done, this exists. Then there'll be a phase of tech dev where we kind of expand collection, make it better, we're going to work with larger collections. We're going to have about 150 genomes by the first part of next year. And then the final the stable version would be 350 genomes and probably sometime in 2026. And uh, then we think we're going to get funding to continue. And this will lead to another 200 genomes at least by 2028. And, and so that's the that's what's going to happen. You already, you already have those 47 genomes. So if you work in a human human genome, might you know, might be worth thinking about using those. Uh, that's a very valuable resource to to build on already. So we built one. We built this thing. There's a paper on it. If you're interested, gets into deep detail. I'm going to skim over a lot, of it, but I'll give you some perspective. So the composition is a little funny. That's because we didn't know how to make the diploid assemblies when we started. We had to use trios. So the parents of the individual we assemble, and we use that trio information to partition the the graph actually that we build from the reads from the, the child into maternal and paternal haplotypes. So we had to have cell lines. They had to be consented for this kind of public release. So we take them from the Thousand Genomes Project. They were in this uh, biobank called Coriel. The trio status meant we didn't get as many Europeans. Then we also wanted few passages of the cell lines. That meant we got even fewer Europeans. We wanted more genetic diversity. That meant we got more Africans, a lot more Africans, because Africa is the center of uh, human diversity. Um, and we wanted to get unique things. So that led to a lot of a lot more East Asians, South Asians, and also uh, people from the Americas. And so you get this kind of funny distribution. There's only 2% or one individual is actually from Europe. That's not the case with the future uh, releases, but that's just how this one went. So uh, I won't talk about the assembly methods at all. I mentioned them a bit. They're kind of like what you saw with Burko. Um, but the gist is that if you take the reads from the assembly, the reads from that were put into the assembly, you map them back to the assemblies themselves, and you ask, like, is the coverage, error rate, et cetera, of the alignments kind of normal? Then virtually all the assemblies, something like 99, at least 99% of the assemblies, um, in all but a few cases, it's green. And that, that would represent a typical, like, haploid covered um, assemblies. And there's some parts that are collapsed, but they're very few. Um, and it's, you know, it's, they're, they're really high quality, uh, amazing things um, that haven't, we've never had even one of them. And in this set, we have about 50. So that, then we build graphs out of them, what, the alignments. And we actually use three methods to do that because there are many, many ways to do it uh, that it can come up with. They have different advantages and disadvantages. So the, the first one, and this is one of the first to be developed to scale to many human genomes by Hung Lee, who's the author of lots of amazing bioinformatic tools, including BWA, which I mentioned, um, Minimap 2, which you've probably used. And if you, you know, if you do bioinformatics, uh, yes. Anyway, so he develops this approach. It's an extension of, of the some of the code in Minimap that will chain minimizers. The mini part is referring to the subset of cameras. And so the, the way that you build the graph is you start with a single sequence. That's a graph. And then you align a new sequence to the graph. Uh, and you line it in the space of these cameras, which are represented with these, these do, uh, dashes. You'll find chunks that are longer than, than a few places where you expect to sample your minimizer, um, in, in Hong's words, about 50 base pairs that, that aren't included in the first one. And then you can include those. You can edit the graph, so go from one node to four, and you can include this new sequence. And then they can continue progressively. So you just progressively, in serial, you, you, know, you add one, augment, another augment, and so on. And, and this is really, uh, really expedient. It's it's pretty low memory. Um, it's in serial, which is kind of hard if you had lots and lots of genomes, but that's fine. Um, it's, it's a very practical way to get access to the, the new sequences, the novel sequences in the, in the space of the pan genome, right? And so you can see the new stuff. I mean, it ignores the small variation, which is hard to work with because um, it gets dense. I'm showing how it gets dense as a figure here. So if you take that mini graph, and you, you realign the original sequences to it. So this is a, a mini graph of one locus with an inversion. So you can go this way or you sort of flip around. You can align all the haplotypes to that and, um, and then take chunks of this and, and realign with an algorithm called cactus or tools from the, the cactus ecosystem might be the best way to describe it. 
uh, or locally, there's kind of a, a whole genome alignment algorithm applied. Uh, it's, it's quite similar in fact, this part to what we call smooth XG in, in the other pipeline I, I showed you guys, but the gist of it is you take the same structure as a mini graph and you add small variants onto it. And so you get this like lossless variation graph out of it. The target of this group, this is led by Benedict Patton and uh, Glenn Hickey. Uh, the, the, the target is to like use this as a tool for read alignment. So they do some kind of pruning and clipping and simplification of the graph so that it, it matches the reference that's easier to use in the variant column. And um, the, yeah, it's, it's an expedient method. It's nice. It also has the foundation. So I didn't discuss this, but if that's your reference, then the graph is structured like your reference. And so you can take the GRC reference, which everyone's accustomed to, and you make the graph in the same structure. It's cool. So this this is PGDB. I described this, but uh, the gist of it is it's like the hard the hard way to go, to do the evaluation. You do the all to all comparison, which I mentioned exascale compute. This is like one chromosome and a bunch of primates. And if you were to compute how many characters were in this matrix, it's it's exascale. But we don't obviously evaluate all of it. Still, it's difficult. But you know we do this because we don't want to have any kind of bias. This is a symmetric comparison. There's no reference bias. There's no order bias. And, and so we see everything simultaneously, uh, but it's harder to work with. And it's harder to do downstream things with it because the kind of structure we got was not like the graphs we used to work with that are based on small variants. And so all the tooling we had for read alignment doesn't work very well on the graphs we make with the system, but it's very good for comparative and evolutionary studies. So we have these three different things and we can compare the mini graph cactus and PGGB graphs because they're both formally variation graphs. They're the same, same kind of structure. We can take variants out of them and compare them. Um, for the sake of time, the gist of this is that they're very, very similar perspectives. And that's cool because it gives us cross-validation. So we know that they're very similar. Uh, I guess we, yeah. And then also they, oh, I guess I don't have, I skipped an accuracy description, which you would have enjoyed, but we, we use uh, read alignments of the, the same sequences that went into the assemblies back to the reference to make a kind of ground truth. And we can compare against that and the accuracy for small variants approaches 99.7%. Um, for large variants, it's in the upper 90s. For very difficult regions like highly repetitive genes, it's lower, but we think that a lot of that is because it's hard to actually make the ground truth that isn't graph-based. So um, we're, we're pushing the quality uh, to the limit of what the assemblies can give us. And oh, the one, this is a key point from this slide. If you need one takeaway, it's that the draft pan genome is adding 100 megabase pairs, so almost a whole chromosome worth of, of euchromatic genic sequence to the pan genome. Um, and it's adding much more um, heterochromatic, so there'll be compacted sequences like in, in satellite sequences and centromeres. Um, but just even knowing that, you're adding 100 megabase pairs. And yeah, so then these are some, some views into it. We cut out regions. This is the RH blood group determination locus. You can cut out this part of the graph. You can look at it and see characteristic structures. You can see where, where certain haplotypes traverse it to understand the relationships to each other in a really compact way. And even though we have, you know, um, 90 haplotypes, there are just a few major isoforms that are recurrent um, and something like five. Which are represented here. So it gives us condensed perspective on what's quite complicated. And the same is true of this particular region in the human MHC, which is on the right part of the slide. There you've got, um, yeah, this is a, a region around HLAA. It has a lot of pseudogenes of HLAA. This is a cool thing. This is probably the biggest sequence that is polymorphic in the population, but is not in uh, the reference. And it's an ancestral state that was deleted in the reference haplotype. So it's something that's a few hundred kb long. So the PGGB is lossless, just takes all the genomes, puts them together, no clipping or anything like that. And that gives us a cool possibility of looking at the structure of whole chromosomes and their relationship to each other in these 90 haplotypes. And what you what you get in two dimensions, this is of course parameter dependent, so it depends on the alignments you make, but you can, you can basically see that you have these chromosome arms and then you have a centromere in the middle, which is this knot another arm. And, and that's basically true for all the chromosomes. This is a path-guided SGD that I was talking about for two-dimensional layouts. And yeah, zooming in, this is C4 locus we talked about before. 
can, can zoom in on this arm of the chromosomes from the bottom. This little region here corresponds to this part of the MHC. The MHC class two genes of this big knot over there. And then um, just for fun, we're gonna look at, these are gene annotations across the graph. So you can take annotations from any one of the haplotypes and project them on the graph. And this is the visualization system. Uh, this is one of the series we've been building to try to get a handle on how to look into the graph interactively. Uh, it's called GFSless. But here we zoom in on C4. <clears throat> this is, I showed an example of this before. It's an interesting gene because it's um, it's part of the complement system, which is, is a, an aid immune system. Uh, it's kind of a, the function of this particular gene is something like immune system signaling glue. It's related to copy number, sorry, it's copy number changes are related to schizophrenia risk. So it's an interesting target and we looked at a lot in the project. But uh, what I want to show is that we see, a, we see something you can't see easily with the short reads or shorter reads or not complete assemblies. And that's that the, the evolution of genomes is not linear. The reason for this is something that has been overlooked a lot in human genetics. It's uh, gene conversion. So, so uh, recombination, we always think about it as, as crossing over, switching parts of chromosomes with each other. But most recombination is actually conversion, homogenization. So, so something like 90% of double strain breaks, meiosis, they resolve through copying of one sequence over another. And that's conversion, it's homogenizing, and it has it results in effects like, like what you see here. Uh, this is like an untangling of all the haplotypes through the two, uh, the two reference copies of the genes, C4A and C4B. And C4A is red, C4B is green. You can see that you usually go red green, like the reference. So that's the ancestral state of thing. Sometimes you get green green, or sometimes you get um, red green. And that red green is a little funny because if everything was linear, you would never expect that to occur. Maybe if you had some kind of complete turnover, you could end up with it. But what we think happens is actually conversion. So this might have been three copies. It might have had two copies of A and then one of B. But what happened at some point in the past is that there was a conversion event of a copy like this one that overrode part of it, making it like C or B. And so this is what I mean by things are nonlinear. There's a companion paper to this, this work. It actually shows this is systematically happening all over the place, and it's a major source of variation in these kinds of genes. Okay, so the last part is really fun. Just enough time to get through it. Uh, so I mentioned the acrocentric chromosomes before. So um, what, what is an acrocentric chromosome? It's a chromosome where the centromere is really close to one end. I'm going to show you quickly here what they are. So these are the centromeres. These are acrocentric. The centromere is really close to the end, 13, 14, 15, 21, and 22, which is flipped for some reason. Um, those are acrocentrics. And in humans, they're, they're unique because they're the place where ribosome biogenesis is driven. And that's the most energy intensive activity of the cell. And so they have a very particular biology about them. And they've been very, very difficult to understand. To show how difficult they've been to understand, we can look at the, the first complete sequence of a human genome. This was established, uh, we, we got this out in 2022. So it's, it's called T to T consortium, telomere to telomere. The assembly goes from telomere to telomere of every chromosome. And it's based on a hydidiform mole that's haploid. It's like a haploid human. Uh, so this is, this is the perspective one provides. So if you look at the reference, the, the standard GRC reference, it has all these regions that are black. And those are regions we could not see before. So they're incomplete assemblies. They're, um, they're represented by ends or by simulated sequences. And these are all filled in in this particular uh, assembly. And usually the pieces we're missing are the centromeres. There's some, some ends, some subtelomeric regions as well. But uh, the really interesting stuff for me were these sequences on the short arms of the acrocentrics. When I first got into genomics, I remember looking at chromosome 20, 22 and, and saying, like, I opened it in a, in a text editor and I just saw ends and ends and ends. And I think, like, why, why is this in here? What is going on? What is actually happening there? This gives us the first perspective on these regions. Um, and it kind of leads to some new mysteries because actually we see them. But if you were to make an assembly graph of the input data, you get this kind of thing. Every chromosome separated except the acrocentric. And we thought that they were being held together by the, those ribosomal DNA repeats, which you see as these sort of knots or labels here. 
Um, but actually, this story is more complicated. So, so looking, zooming in here, um, this plot is basically comparing every chromosome to every other one in the T to T. The darker it is, the more similar. And there are basically like these are the ribosomal regions, they're very similar to each other. But then there are other regions here between different pairs of chromosomes are highly, highly, highly identical. And uh, we wanted to understand in the pan genome project, uh, you know, what's going on with those regions. So, so in the process of a, a kind of quality evaluation, we checked to see where there were assemblies that were matching multiple multiple chromosomes. So the contig in principle from a new genome, which should only match one chromosome in the reference, unless there's been rearrangements or a recombination. And we actually find that um, that's true all the time, with the exception of acrocentric contigs. And these are two visualizations of this process. The, the one on the right is probably easier to understand that basically it's taking the short arms of all the acrocentrics. And every time that there's kind of a, a recombination implied, you see a, a colored line. And, and the color represents the relative orientation. Um, blue, I think, is an inversion. So uh, you can also see the same data here. It's plotted every contact is a node here, including the reference ones. These are the, the reference ones are colored. And all the haplotype contigs are between them because they map to multiple ones. Um, yeah, this is jargon that I, I I need to identify. By contig, we mean a contiguous assembly chunk. A piece of the assembly were like totally sure it's contiguous, and and that's all contig means. It means a contiguous assembly component. So that's the unit of of system that we work with in the HPRC. We didn't scaffold them in the whole chromosomes. We didn't know how they scaffolded in whole chromosomes. In fact, it would have frustrated this analysis if we tried to do that. So, yeah, so we're working on context. And, and then we saw this kind of pattern when we did this misjoint analysis, but we were curious, if we systematically do that for all, this, all the assemblies, all the contigs, what kind of structures come out? And, and so we do two things. Um, well, three things, really. First, we do a homology mapping. We use mash map to compare them all to each other really fast. And then we'll represent that as a, as a homology graph. The nodes are contigs, the edges are when they match each other. We can visualize that. Um, and for visualization, we won't show the whole thing. We'll just show like a subset of all the matchings, just the best three. And, and, and then we can do a quantitative analysis of it. So, so first up, this is when you take all the contigs of the HPRC and you align them, you map them rather to each other, making this kind of graph. And the visualization holds things together that are connected by more edges. And so most, most of the chromosomes, so we're labeling where the reference chromosomes are, right? Those are these black dots. Most of them just go up on their own if you were to, to lay this out in a kind of force-directed way. They would just drift off. The acrocentrics don't. They stick together. And here we're coloring by where we think the contents come from. You see that there's this, well, I'll zoom in in a second. And you also get the sex chromosomes you put together. In humans, and, and you know, that's very normal because those actually recombine with each other. Their subtelomeric regions, the pseudo autosomal regions, recombine. So that was a positive control that made us think that this pattern was representing some kind of recombination exchange. And so you see that these contexts here, they match the, the long arm, the Q arm of the chromosomes, the ones on the outside, whereas the, the muddled, muddled mix in the middle, when we looked, we saw that those were matching the short arm. And so that, this is a human level visualization. So to, to then under make it quantitative, we applied a community detection algorithm called Leiden. And uh, this partitions the set of contexts into communities that are modular in the sense that they're more internally related than externally related. And every chromosome or chromosome arm has its own community with the exception of the sex chromosomes, which are uh, this community here, it's, it's corresponding to chromosome X1 or the acrocentrics, where what's called called community for chromosome 22 is, contains lots and lots and lots of contigs that um, appear to match other chromosomes if we were to align them to the reference set of chromosomes. Yeah, we should be... Uh, it's done. Yeah. yeah, it's done. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we do this community detection. This is just visualizing it. And so we said, okay, let's make a graph to see the base level relationships. And this just shows that we collected contigs that we could anchor on a long arm. 
So they cross the centromere and they go into the short arm by at least the megabase pair, build a graph, and we get this structure out of it. And this is kind of the main result. Uh, there's more dissection of it because if the tangle here gets untangled. But the gist of it is that all the long arms are isolated. And if you were to zoom in on the centromeric regions, they some of them share centromeric regions. So you come together, and then the centromeres just kind of mix in the graph. And then there's this crazy tangle here that corresponds to the short arms. And, and if you were to zoom in on this further, there's even the ribosomal DNA arrays from the reference. And there's a very interesting region around an, a repeat called SST1, um, which I'll, I'll highlight. So yeah, this is a tangled thing. So how do you understand what's going on? Like, is it just collapsing together because you made it do that because you set alignment parameters to do that? Or is it because of recombination exchange that would homogenize things? To dissect that, we untangle every one of the chromosomes using a method just like the one I showed for C4. I said, oh, every, every haplotype can be represented by different orders of C4. So we use something quite like that. So for every haplotype, we're asking which one of the acrocentric chromosomes is it more similar to in the graph in a local region. And what you see is pretty clear that on the long arm, every, this is for chromosome 13, right? So everyone here, all these contigs, they're matching chromosome 13. And then in this region, this is a centromere. Centromere is actually diversifying. So they don't match each other very well. They're not aligned together very well here. We can't actually untangle them because they don't match even in the graph. They just kind of unfold into a tangled mess. This is a region around what's called SST1. And in this part, you see that it's a patchwork. Every haplotype is matching, best matching, a different constellation of, of chromosomes. And usually they're involving chromosomes 13, 14, and 21 in this case. But there's also pieces of chromosome 15, for example. And uh, if you get closer go over here, that's the ribosomal DNA repeats. They're in the, the reference assembly. But we don't really have the ability to assemble this current technology automatically. So, so they're just empty. We don't have any data passing. We can, we can take this information and build an entropy metric of it. This is the one that we actually use. It's called order entropy. It looks, thinks about like the relative phylogeny um, of relationships across all the, all the haplotypes. And, and if, if that goes above, basically, if it goes above zero for a certain amount of time, then we think that they must be recombining because how would the how would the phylogenetic order locally be changing unless there was mixing going on? And so we use that to make an annotation which we call the pseudo-homologous regions, the PHR. Right? And so here there's three, three main chunks of them kind of drawn at the top. And this is the, this is possible to do on all the acrocentric chromosomes. We get different kinds of patterns. Um, the one on 15 is quite small. We just call it, this one's probably just associated with the ribosomal DNA. Um, the architecture of 15 is very different than the other chromosomes. Um, it has this big, should be clear, clear why. This is a very highly repetitive sequence here. That, that means that they don't really match each other as much. And it's hard to assemble too. So chromosome 21, it's, again, here you see the same pattern, but from the perspective of 21. Um, and 22, which is again, a little bit less intense, but it has the same kind of regions, often involving chromosome 14 for some reason. And so zooming in on this region I mentioned before, SST1. So this is a repetitive sequence, and it's in the middle of a place where we see this very, very high identity between different chromosomes. It's a, they're, they're as homologous as regular chromosome pairs. So 99.9% .9 identical um, in this region. Uh, this on the, do I zoom in? No, I don't zoom in. So on the, on the right, it's kind of multiple, it's like a multiple as and in this megabase pair in the two around this, this repeat, you see that the, the color is very dark and that corresponds to uh, almost perfect identity between the different chromosomes. So uh, this is an interesting region because it's been hypothesized to be a place where there's recurrent breakpoints of uh, Robertsonian translocations. This is the most common chromosomal abnormality in humans. Uh, it happens in one in uh, uh, every 800 <coughs> live births. It's estimated. And the Robertsonian translocation is two acrocentrics that have been stuck together in a configuration like this at the bottom. There was a study uh, five or six years ago that tried to find the breakpoint using laboratory techniques. So they took Robertsonian chromosomes. Um, in this case, it was from their combinations of uh, 21 and 14. And they used probes, DNA, with fluorescent, fluorescent molecules attached. 
they, they, they probe and try to see if they exist in Robertsonian or don't. We're showing that data here in, in red and green bars. And this shows against the TUT reference where those match. If they're red, they're not in the Robertsonian. If they're green, they are. Um, and then much, much of the chromosomes are confirmed to be they're using what's called chromosome painting, collection of probes that match particular chromosomes. So, so they don't probe everything, but they, um, we took their data, we made a hypothesis, which is shown in this figure, matches this. Here we're, we're kind of manually aligning the chromosomes in an inverted orientation, because on 14, this region is actually inverted relative to the other, to 21 and to 13. And we've lined them up so that this region is, is here in the middle. And we can see that if there's crossover happened here, that, that exactly corresponds to the fish mapping data. Like the green parts are all where we expect the chromosome to be built from. And so the, the stuff in red is represented here in this micro chromosome that's lost. It's no, because it doesn't have a centromere, it's lost from the cell line. It's lost from the individual completely. And then the Robertsonian is here. So I uh, think this is kind of like kind of strong. And to confirm it, we've actually assembled four cell lines, including Robertsonians, and the breakpoint occurs in this region. So we wouldn't publish that yet, not showing data, but it, it is actually where it's occurring. So this is cool because here we have this really new data, new methods, and we've, we've answered questions that have been around since we could see chromosomes with microscopes because the Robertsonians have been known about for a very long time. And we're talking about stuff that arose 50 years ago in early cytogenetic research. So uh, yeah, this is a paper from 1988, not 50 years ago, but quite long ago. And they say, we think, we hypothesize that there is recombination exchange between these chromosomes because how else could their sequences be so similar in their centromeres? They were just sequencing the centromere repeats, but they're like, it has to be maintained by, by something. This is some other cool old data. It's n of one, but the total n in their study was something like five. Well, what are they doing? They take a spermatocyte and it's been frozen in time at the point when there's a recombination occurring between maternal and paternal haplotype. So there's a synaptonomal context, uh, complexes. We say that the chromosomes are in synapse. They then they come together. It's actually they come together because of recombination, because they've, they have double-stranded breaks to invade. This pulls the chromosomes together. And uh, what then they, they've dissected this by, by like cutting it. It's frozen and they cut it in slices and do electron microgas to see where the chromosomes fit, which you can see over on the, on the right the slide. And, and what you see, uh, so then they re reconstruct in three dimensions using some crazy thing like, like transparencies overlaid on top of each other and draw it. This is nucleolus. So that's where the ribosome biogenesis is occurring. And who's hanging out on it? 14, 13, and 21. And so, so you just go and look and you see that the acrocentrics that are recombining with each other, actually, they also physically approximate. And uh, then just to show that it's really, really hard to do this with a direct laboratory assay, you might think it's not because the chromosome's big, but these events are rare. And to find them, you have to do an analysis of many hundreds or to, to match what we've done, many thousands, tens of thousands of oocytes, for example. Here they did 300 to find a single case where there's a synapse between 14 and 21. And, and so imagine, imagine doing you know, 10,000 of those to build up statistics. It would be, it would be almost impossible. So that's suggestive, but we look back in the history of the population to see all the recombination events that have occurred in, in the lineages of all the genomes we're looking at. And, and this has allowed us to build kind of synthesis of what's going on in the evolutionary sense in these regions. So we have pseudo-homologous regions with the short arms of the acrocentrics. They um, have different orientations and different pieces. Um, they must be physically proximal. Like, you know, you can see that literally here, but it, it kind of makes sense that if their ends and the ribosomes are ribosome genesis, a biogenesis is occurring. Those ribosomal genes are embedded in nucleoli, they'll be close together, right? And that physical proximity and the, and the ongoing sequence similarity drives recombination, which is usually homogenizing, right? So usually it's not crossing over, but it's actually making the sequences more and more similar to each other. Um, and we know because Robertsonians exist that it also can cause crossover type recombination. And so probably these ends of the chromosomes are flipping around between each other all the time. And, and it, the Robertsonian is, is a, you know, a bad outcome of what's typically a benign and, and kind of strange 
process that's going on continuously. Okay. So that's it. We published it and you can read about it in detail. And with that, I'd like to thank a ton of people who are kind of supporting me in my lab. There's a lot of folks, uh, probably the, the two to point out are uh, Simon Poimos, who developed the visualization techniques that you guys are just looking at, the 2D ones that we've used, and works on PGB and Augie with us, and Andrea Guardacino who does tons and tons of things. He's a postdoc in my group. He was responsible for closing the HPRC paper, the, sorry, the acrocentric paper, um, and taking it from a, an initial analysis that I did to something that was really robust. And, and so, of course, the HPRC are all its members. I, I'm completely indebted to them. What you're seeing is a result of the effort they've been put forward. So, all right, with that, okay, thanks. Thanks, 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 for, thanks for sticking around. Okay, thanks for this seminar. I think it's very nice. Yes. Any questions? I have one question. Yeah. Yeah, we can discuss over. So, what happens okay. to UCG numbers? UCG numbers. Oh, it's still useful, you know? No, but yeah. is there how is it evolved? Yeah. It's going to evolve to a yeah, um, so it, it only has the facility to put alignments in. So you can look at alignments already in it. And so what we can do is we can take the graphs, pull the alignments out, and then put them into the browser. And that's kind of what's been going on. But in terms of browsing the graph natively, it's it's not happening yet. And it's going to be a big lift for them to do that. In, in my group, we're developing tools and like libraries to do in-browser visualization of the graph. And we think is maybe leading to, to something like that, but that's been really difficult. We have to yeah. use like GPU programming on in the browser to efficiently get these two dimensional visualizations and look at them. So it'll, it'll be an interesting process to try to make it more useful. But I think, I mean, I think reference genomes are here to stay. In fact, what we've done, it's not like we made a graph, we actually made a bunch of reference genomes. Right. And the graphs are just like, you know, things that fall out of analyses that we do on. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, Thank I you. I have a question about standards for this data storage because you mentioned fast storage. So yeah, yeah, we use old or yeah. even bump down files. They are not suited for analysis. They are just the uh, information storage. But uh, in my opinion, what we need is uh, some formats that can be directly used for analysis. Like yeah, the graphs. the graphs. Yeah, there's a standard. Uh, Hung Li actually is the initial generator of it. So in the process of making assemblies, he had to make the same kind of graphs. And then uh, it's called the Graphical Fragment Assembly Format, GFA. Seeing this format, I was like, well, you know, if we add paths and restrict it in two or three ways, then we can use it for VG to represent the graphs. And then Hong came back and said, well, sometimes we also have haplotypes that aren't like reference quality, but we can infer. And so then added annotation method for those. They're called walks or W lines. So you have like line types. There's nodes, there's edges, there's paths, which are meant to be like reference quality. And then there's walks, which are meant to be haplotypes. And, and so that we use that all the time. We publish these graphs in that way. And that's that's one. And then you can have an extension of alignments to the graph, too. So, so you can have, uh, we call it uh, GAF format. Hung also did this, too. But it's just that he took his existing format called pairwise alignment format. And he made it so that the target uh, wasn't, um, wasn't necessarily just a reference sequence. It could be like a series of nodes. And, and so then your target references like a series of nodes, everything just works out after that. You don't have to change almost anything. And so we use that in analyses based on DG. In fact, giraffe, the name giraffe is, is a referring to GAF format, GAF. That's, that's where the name comes from. But I, I don't think we need any other standards, actually. I think those are enough for the time being. Oh, I mean, there's, there's some standards that can be placed, for instance, bomb or crowns, and we can directly copy. Yeah, there, uh, Piotr Prinz, uh, you mentioned in the um, he, he's also a professor at University of Tennessee. He's working on a graph band called a generalized band, a G band format, as a, an implementation of this. We haven't used it in practice, but I think something like that will have to come about. We have various versions of it. Um, but they haven't been deployed very widely. What is it going to take for the sequence of dimensional genes to be assembled? Oh, yeah. So those reads have to get longer. So it, but they may be at their limit. Speed. Yeah. Have like yeah if, you can span, long... if you could span the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. Some, some of them, you know, it is possible to get a read that spans some of the shorter versions of it locals. So there are some that can be assembled. 
And there's some that the assembly assemblies will automatically produce. Like uh, I won't go back to it, but there, there are a few assemblies we see that claim to kind of cross the ribosomal um, DNA. We don't know if those are accurate or not. Um, for the foreseeable future, it's going to take some weird tooling, basically. And what was done, even in the CHM13 uh, reference, was a kind of simulated model. In fact, it's kind of a dirty secret, but the the assembly data was clustered as best as possible by chromosome. A graph model, the string graph was built, and as much as possible was untangled using manifold reads, and then it was sampled to be the right length. Yeah, it's 